Steve, why don't you tell us what it was like as your family pioneered ministry at Harbert Hills Academy? My father showed up at Madison, Aca uh, Madison College, came from California at the young age of 18. He left California with just a few dollars in his pocket, enough for a bus ticket to get across the country and to uh, Madison. He showed up there and he said, well, here I am. I'm ready to go to school. He was accepted into college. And uh, sure enough, they let him in with just a few dollars in his pocket. He began to work his way through school there. My mother showed up from Massachusetts. Uh, she had been raised, her father was in the Navy and had moved all over the countryside. At the age of 15, she had become converted to Adventism through a friend of hers. She was the only Adventist in her family, but she felt impressed at the, uh, when it was time to go to college that she should try to go to a Seventh-day Adventist college. Because the family didn't have a lot of money, she ended up at Madison College and she was taking the nursing course there. And her and my father became acquainted. Eventually, were, they were married. One day, they were sitting in chapel together, and as the custom was for many chapel services at Madison, one of the things they did regularly was they made an appeal for new work to get started. And so, Mr. William E. Patterson was standing up in front of the auditorium in chapel there, and he was saying, you know, we're going to start some new work and we have a vision to start a new school, and I'm going to need some help. And he began to describe his vision of what he wanted to do in helping young people and uh, to earn their way through school and to plant an institution where there was no Seventh-day Adventist presence. And um, as I heard the story, my mother elbowed my father in the ribs and said, Louis, I think that's us. And, uh, of course, with a little elbowing, uh, you, you usually get up, right? <laughs> and so my father and my mother went forward and dedicated themselves to helping to begin the work of this institution. This was in 1951, in the late part of 1951. And uh, Mr. Patterson went to Hardin County, Tennessee. Now, Hardin County, Tennessee is an interesting place. There was no Seventh-day Adventist presence in that county. In fact, there was no Seventh-day Adventist presence in about nine counties surrounding Hardin County. Hmm. But God had not left this place forsaken. Several years before that time, he had sent two call porters working their way through Madison to Hardin County. And these two young men went to the county, and there was something very interesting going on in the county as they were getting ready uh, to do their call porter, and they found out there was a, a high-profile murder case going on. And they both had a little interest in that, and so they said, you know what? We're going to go call porter, and then when we get done call porting, we're going to go check and see what's going on with this, with this case. And so they began to watch the case as it went through, and they became acquainted with the judge, whose name was Judge Harbert. Well, um, so they were kind of paving the way. And when Mr. Patterson showed up in Hardin County, he said, I'm needing some property to start a school. Who should I see? And someone directed them to Judge Harbert. Judge Harbert sat with them in his office, and he said, Mr. Patterson, I, I understand what you're saying here, and I'll be happy to help you. Here's a, a plat of my property. You go out and pick out what you think you need and let me know what that is. And if you do what you say you're going to do, then you can have that property. But if 10 years from now you haven't done it, it comes back to me. So 220 acres was donated to the project. The Madison College students came on board. They began to come to Harvard Hills Academy property. There was nothing there. They started clearing land. They eventually uh, built a little uh, campsite there and continued. There was no electricity. There was no running water. They began to clear the right of way and bring the electricity in and uh, eventually drilled a well and actually had something going on there. So it took a little while. But God was blessing in the process, and people were, the students from Madison would come down and they would work there and, and, and trying to get something started there. Well, it's just amazing what God does over time and with people that are willing. And um, Mr. Patterson's son, David Patterson, and my father brought their business. They were in the business of rebuilding pianos. So they moved their business there so that there was an industry at Harbor Hills Academy. My mother and Mr. Patterson's wife started a nursing home. We were the smallest licensed nursing home in the state of Tennessee with three beds. 
we laugh about it today. <laughs> Three little beds there. And the, uh, the, the <clears throat> funds to build that first little home there, it was called the Clara Ellis Hayes Home. Mr. Patterson had an be interesting background, Mr. Patterson Sr. He was an agent for the federal government. And his job was to put people in jail. And so it was rather interesting. One day someone knocked on his office door there at the college and said, Mr. Patterson, uh, I'd like to talk to you. He said, okay, come in. He said, my name is Roger Hayes. Do you remember me? Mr. Patterson says, no, I don't think I do. He said, well, you put me in jail. And I told you that if I ever got out, I was going to come back and see you. Well, at that point, Mr. Patterson became just a little bit nervous, wondering what was next. But he said, no, I've heard about what you're doing. Don't worry, I've heard about what you're doing down in Hardin County, and I want to help you. He said, uh, what do you need? He said, well, we need a building. We're going to start a little nursing home there. He said, well, how much is that going to cost? And he pulled out and he wrote Mr. Patterson a check for what he asked for to build that first little building for a nursing home. Mm. And Mr. Patterson told him, look, we've got a problem here. We can't name this after you. His practice was to name things after the person that donated the money. He said, we can't name this after you because you're a gangster. He said, I can't have that on the campus. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Hayes said, well, no problem. You can name it after my mother. And so the Clara Ellis Hayes home was started, three residents. Now we have 49 residents in a beautiful facility there. God has blessed immeasurably. We have about um, 60 to 80 students in the school. We have uh, a farm program and a, a, a radio station broadcasting to between Nashville and Memphis and all those, those rural areas out there. There are four churches that exist in that local area now. And it's not all because of what happened there. But Madison had a part to play in this. They were inspiring lay people to do amazing things. Many people were coming out of Madison doing these amazing things all across the South and around the world. It's just amazing. And I believe that God had a plan. Madison wasn't an easy place. We've heard about that already. But I think that was for a reason because God was showing people there if it can be done here, it can be done anywhere. Amen. You know, Steve, God is raising up a generation of, of leaders and young Amen. people who will carry that torch of self-sacrifice, of commitment, of mission focus. And uh, God is raising up once again in this generation. You know, one thing, though, that um, is a little troubling, frankly, and that is that Madison did not continue. Madison closed. Is there a reason for that? Are there any instructive lessons that the church can learn today from the fact that here, here's an institution that was reported about in Reader's Digest. Here's an institution that the United States Education Department actually lauded as a model of American education. Here's an institution that spawned scores of other institutions and had hundreds and hundreds of uh, students go out all over the world, but yet it does not exist in that same form today. What lessons are instructive? Well, I think there's several lessons. Uh, one of the lessons that I take from it is the great need of our institutions across the country and around the world, whether they're supporting ministries or church-owned institutions. There is a huge need for leadership. And E.A. Sutherland was in his waning years. In 1955, E.A. Sutherland passed away. The school lasted beyond that for about another nine years. But leadership is so extremely important. And this was one of the things, one of the qualities that I, I believe God was engendering in the people that came to Madison because the conditions were difficult. And as you have mentioned, sometimes difficulties in our life are the best teachers. They're very instructive. We learn rather quickly under very difficult conditions. And so I would just challenge our, our ASI family. Some of you are leaders. Some of you have leadership ability. And God may be calling you to step out of your comfort zone and to step into institutional life where leaders are in such demand. Just since being here at this convention, I have had several institutional leaders come to me and say, please help us. We need people. While it's true, money is helpful. 
even more helpful than money is people, and we need people that are dedicated people who will come and put their lives into the work that God is doing in our institutions. So it's a huge thing. I think there's a couple of other things, though, um, and, and as far as being instructive. I think we need to be very careful with what God gives us. Madison had been in a time of decline for a number of years, and the facilities were declining. And their relationship with the state demanded that they have good facilities and for housing the nursing students and for teaching and things like that. The facilities had been allowed to decline. Now, this, this was really at the very beginning of ASI, and so there was not that kind of organization in place to help the institution see the need and provide some of those resources for capital improvements that needed to take place. So it was the leadership issue, capital improvements, and um, sometimes we get distracted in an institutional environment and we're paying attention to the minor things when we need to be paying attention to the, to the big things. And so that's another thing that I think had some impact on what was happening there. So, you know, it, um, it, it, we do have a need, in fact, for workers without a question. You know, Otto Wilson, as we think about leadership, you sit as president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and leadership is a need all over the world. Share with us just briefly a few qualities that you see in godly Christian leaders today. What are the kind of qualities that God uses in leaders to really take the church beyond where it is, to take an institution beyond where it is for aspiring leaders? Essentially, it requires an absolute faith in God, a humble spirit. And I, I tell you, and I speak to myself, all leaders today can be challenged with the glamour or the centrality of position and it is only in humbling ourselves before God that we'll see anything accomplished of any real value. Amen. If you are a humble leader, even if you may not be schooled in the best techniques of leadership, God will use you just as he did the disciples. And self-supporting work and ASI, the aspects that we've been talking about today, one of the greatest characteristics, Steve, is really in terms of leadership, people who are willing to do anything they could to advance the work of God. So leadership certainly has to be humble, it has to be knowledgeable, it has to be completely leaning upon the Lord himself, and it has to be creative. And the Lord intends for us to use creative ideas and our own initiative and he will add his blessing to what happens. Another huge factor in leadership today is faith. Mm. Faith in Amen. the wonderful remnant understanding of God's precious prophetic movement and that God truly will be the leader. You know, this morning we had a powerful sermon to help us to understand not to place our trust mm. in ourselves or in what we can do but to lean completely on God's power to accomplish it and not only God's power but God's way of accomplishing Amen. it. Amen. And That's of true. course as we read in the spirit of prophecy we have so much instruction about how God wants to accomplish his work. We need to have faith to follow it. You know Charles, God trains leaders in a variety of ways and Let's go back to some of that early history and discover how God trains leaders. Elder Finley, when Walla Walla and when Emmanuel Missionary and when Madison each started, they each started very much in privation and difficulty. There were few bathtubs. There was no air conditioning. In many cases, there was no heat. There was no excess money. They made do with whatever they had on hand. The first year at Madison, they had corn and cows. They sold butter to get flour. The diet was cornbread and milk toast. And to introduce some variety into the diet, they created brewists. 
Brewis was when you broke your toast into smaller pieces before you poured on the skim milk. <laughs> and when they were tempted to complain, Ed would remind everyone that the children of Israel ate manna for 40 years. They could manage for one. I would like to close my remarks with these words from Lyda Scott when she was reporting to the assembled representatives from the units in 1934, and I'm now quoting. Recently, some of the graduates of Madison College have had real experience in helping to establish a unit in Alabama, working in cooperation with the Mississippi-Alabama Conference. None are promised salaries. These they must earn for themselves. Two others of our graduates have gone to two little church schools in needy Mississippi areas. As an encouragement to those who are studying the self-supporting cooperative plan of units, I would say this. There are units needing reinforcements. There are places still available to earnest groups of people capable of working together effectively in cooperation and able to provide for themselves. The Lord has faithful men and women with money being prepared in hidden places who will respond to his call in the fullness of time. And to illustrate, I came across one of these hidden ones this year. She said to me, if some with vision, a will, and the muscle will respond, I will furnish the money. She could not get young folks with the will to work and the determination to stick it out through thick and thin. This woman had been waiting and praying for 20 years. Hmm. It is easier to raise the means than it is to raise the men. Hmm. The night is coming when no man can work before the shadows deepen into darkest midnight the world has ever seen, some must call, answer the call, saying, here am I, send me. Amen. Amen. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. They're on, they're going, The Savior has come in his mighty power and spoke in peace to my soul. And all of my life from that very hour, I've yielded to his control. I've yielded to his control. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful what Jesus has done for the soul of my the half has never been told. Jesus has done for this soul of mine. Oh, the half has never been told. Never been told. From glory to glory he leads me on, from grace to grace every day. And brighter and brighter that glory dawns while pressing my homeward way, while pressing my homeward way. Wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful what Jesus has done for the soul of mine. The half has never been told, never been told. It is wonderful, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful, wonderful what Jesus has done for the soul of mine. Oh, the half has never been told. Never been told, it is 
wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful, wonderful what Jesus has done for this soul of mine. Oh, the half has never, the half has never, the half has never been. What are we going to do? Who's going to start another Madison? How are we going to continue God's work? And, and the need is huge around the world. And as you've heard us talk just a little bit about this, the need for leadership is huge. And, but God is challenging individuals. I recently attended the Madison College alumni. They've been closed for over 60 years, but they still have an alumni meeting in June of each year where the graduates get together and they talk about their experience that happened to them there at Madison. Today, as never before, God is calling for workers. He's calling for people who will enter his vineyard and do his work. You know, it's, it's relatively uh, inviting and comfortable to move into a community where there are many other Adventists and to kind of, you know, plant yourself there and attend the local Seventh-day Adventist church and sit in the pew. It just gets kind of comfortable, doesn't it? Well, I believe we're at a time in Earth's history where God is calling us to do something more than to keep the pews warm in these larger communities. We're being called to go to places where there is no Seventh-day Adventist work. Hundreds and hundreds of cities and towns across this nation, thousands of cities and towns and villages across the world needing someone to come and give them the good news of the gospel. Well, the good news is today that the work that God is calling people to do is being responded to. We are not uh, in a situation where no one is responding to that call. We have several stories we want to tell you today. The first story comes from the country of Romania. I think we have some folks from Romania here today. The little school is being started there. It's called Integritas. And they read the book, Madison, God's Beautiful Farm, and they began to search for what they might do to fulfill that kind of vision for education. And as they were searching and praying, um, I, I went at one point to talk with them and encourage them in their quest to start something there in Romania. And they took me to a piece of property on a hillside there, and they said, we're going to start something here. It's amazing what God is doing there. We're going to start something here. And I said, it's a beautiful piece of property. It's a lovely place to start a little school. And they said, that's what we'd like to do. And so we began to encourage them and to pray with them and to give them some counsel and they began to work. And uh, we're going to show you just a short video clip right now about the work that is happening in Romania, the beginning of this little school there. And I say little school. You'll see when, you, when they show the video that uh, God is really blessing there. And uh, again, what did they do? They started reading the book. And they started reading the books, God's Counsel, the book on education, and other books. And they said, we've got to do something. And God inspired them to do something. And so we're going to ask them to roll that video right now. Ai dori o educație în care Biblia să fie la baza tuturor activităților? Ce zice de o școală care împletește cunoștințele academice cu abilitățile practice și misiunea? Apreciez o educație care pune accent pe dezvoltarea caracterului? O educație în care profesorul îți este și prieten. Ți-ar plăcea o școală situată în mijlocul naturii?
Proiectul educațional Integritas, asemenea unei semințe plantate într-un pământ prielnic, a luat naștere prin citirea cărții Madison, Școala lui Dumnezeu. Dorim să oferim elevilor o educație bazată pe un curiculum creștin, în care principiile divine stau la temelia întregului sistem. Gândit pe principiul auto-întreținerii, cele 20 de hectare ale campusului sunt amenajate, astfel încât culturile de exterior și cele de interior să fie valorificate prin muncă perseverentă și binecuvântarea lui Dumnezeu. Prin intermediul unor cluburi practice, elevii vor învăța știința cultivării pământului, arta apiculturii, clase de gătit sănătos, remedii naturale și diverse alte abilități. Pentru a reproduce cât mai mult atmosfera de familie, cel mai bun mediu de educație, liceul va beneficia de internate integrate. Aceasta înseamnă că un număr mic de băieți sau de fete vor fi în grijă a câte două familii de profesori pedagogi, care vor avea apartamentele atașate casei internat. Obiectivele noastre sunt dezvoltarea echilibrată, pregătirea pentru viață, cultivarea relației cu Dumnezeu și a iubirii față de seme. Succesul în educație depinde de fidelitatea cu care respectăm planul Creatorului. Things haven't changed, have they? Success depends on following God's plan. And I would challenge you, my friends, to uh, continue to allow God to speak to you about what He wants you personally to do. We have another story today. We're going to share actually four more stories. So get ready for four more great stories about what God is doing around the world with starting new things and, and impressing people to do something for Him. I would like to invite Wes uh, Stable to join me here. This story comes to us uh, from Arkansas. Anybody here from Arkansas today? Wes, you're here from Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Now, Wes, um, you uh, at one point were a chicken farmer. Yes, sir. What, um, what happened with that? I don't think you're a chicken farmer anymore. Tell me, tell me about that. Well, I had always in my life uh, felt like I was a failure at witnessing. And I wanted to do something for God in witnessing, but I didn't know what to do. We had tried so many things. I felt mm -hmm. like if God handed out report cards, I would have an A in prayer, an A in Bible study, and a D minus in witnessing. Oh my. And I wanted something to happen. So you were open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Definitely. Your little church appointed you to an office. What did they ask you to they do? They asked me to be the personal ministries director. Now that sounds pretty, that sounds pretty innocent. Just be the personal ministries director. What did God do with that opportunity? Well, I had never been personal ministries director before. And when I took the position, I'm not the kind that wants to just stand in the podium and read the conference papers. And I wanted something to happen. So, um, I had read an article in the Northern Union paper about a Bible worker going to a church in Minnesota. And uh, uh, I, I thought, that's what we got to do. We, we, need a, we need a Bible worker. We need a full-time person to come and stir us and get us going in this church. I want something to happen. So you're looking for a Bible worker. Did you find one? Yes, we did, but it was a difficult uh, task. We had found that the Bible worker that went to Minnesota had come through Louis Therese School in All South right. Dakota. Yeah. And so I called him, and he said, no, Wes, he said, these people don't just come here and take training and then hope to find a place to go. They're sent by a church, and they're trained, and they go back to their church. Actually, he thought he found me someone, and then we got disappointed, and it ah. didn't happen. So, who did you end up getting? Okay. I just wish. I need two hours to tell the story. <laughs> but I well, wish... that's okay. We got four more minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I, you'll have to keep track of the time. But uh, God providentially brought us, if we can put on the screen the picture of these two people, uh, Daniel and Nerida McKibben. 
They were um, people that we knew nothing about. And those people came, and when I took them through the church and through the fellowship hall, I heard Nara to say to Daniel, Daniel, we could do our treatments in this room. And I'm thinking, what? Bible workers don't do treatments. And I said, treatments what? And she says, well, we're medical missionaries as well. So you not only got a Bible worker, but you got a medical missionary. We got two medical missionaries and of the finest order. I said, well, what qualifies you to do medical work? <laughs> and that's when I found out that Daniel was a licensed massage therapist. He had been in charge of the Lifestyle Center at Eden Valley for seven years, and Nerida was a doctor. So how did that impact what what, how you got into this thing with medical missionary work. Because I got involved with these people. I wanted to know about medical missionary work. I'd read about it, never met one in my life. And we learned a lot about medical missionary work. And while they were there, do we have it on the screen that this couple came in who had a huge cancer. And uh, he had been to the doctors and the doctors had told him, you got two months to live. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, there's no hope for this man. He was 72 years old. And believe it or not, uh, in six months' time, through her natural remedy program, he was sent back to the doctors, and he was uh, told that he was cancer-free. Amen. And he's Amen. returned to our center just recently. This We're talking about 15 years later. He is still cancer-free. So at that point, you kind of bought into this I thing. I did. I'm telling you, that said, okay, bye-bye retirement. <laughs> I was saving up for retirement. My hot tub, my motor home, we're going to travel the whole United States. And I said goodbye to that. I want to do this work. So actually, what I hear you saying is that God impressed you to take these funds you would save for retirement, and the church is actually purchased a little piece of property. They've started a medical missionary center across the road. This is amazing what God has done. Mm. It would take me too long to tell you. I've got it on a DVD if any of you come by the booth. It's 245. You'd hear the whole story there. So, so you have the whole story there. But let me just ask you a question, Wes, as we close out here today. I want you to just share with the folks here today. How has this changed your personal life to get involved like this? I was a Laodicean Seventh-day Adventist just living life, and it has totally changed me. I understand what it means to be born again. Amen. What's inside of me is to do God's work. I have no desire for this world Amen. of any kind. So a Laodicean Seventh-day Adventist gets impressed by God to take his retirement money and invest in a wellness center. And what I hear you saying today is it has just completely altered the way you think about life in general. This is the greatest retirement that I could ever have. I am up there every day. We have worship at 945 every day. And, and then we begin our day. But it has been the most wonderful experience. God has led me there. I had never in my life prayed, Lord, what would you have me to do in my life? I directed my own life, but he took me through this means to this work. Wes, what would you say to someone sitting here today who, as you've been telling your story, they've kind of been feeling like maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to them? What would you say to them? I would just say, pray, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? God is able. He led me at the age of 55 after I had worn probably five different hats in life. And uh, he's put me into this work, and I'm not going to retire until I die. What's the greatest need of Wellness Secrets right now? The greatest need that we have. I am looking at all of you and wondering, who is there? You know, it says in Luke 10, uh, verse 2, that the harvest is great and the labors are few. We need labors. We need at least two more. One could be the director of the center. If we had more workers, what things we could do because we have a beautiful center sitting there ready to go, 
if we had more workers. Amen. Thank you so much today, Wes, for sharing. God bless you and the work you're doing there. Thank you for the opportunity, and I want to say this, this is the first time at ASI. It has been a blessing to me to hear the testimonies. It has encouraged me. God is working and is going to finish the work. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wes. Our next story is, uh, comes to us from two young ladies who have been called by God to some very interesting work. Um, now, I understand um, that you're working in a closed country, so you won't hear us today talking about the name of the country in which you're working. We're going to avoid that if we can. And, um, but uh, we have Gina. Gina, how did God get you involved in this work? That is so good. Um, I was actually working there as, a, as an attorney. So you had gone to this country. You're working there as an attorney. Mm -hmm. And um, what that one thing led to another? How did the Lord was impressing you? Uh, yes, just uh, seeing the local people, their local struggle, uh, just not for financial means, but uh, for the lack of spiritual. Um, there was no one really to tell them about God. And they didn't have the hope of the resources that we have, the things we take for granted. Mm. Hi, Ji, how did you get into this? Yes, so I'm a physical therapist, and I actually took a year off to become an English teacher. So you're teaching English, and she's there working as a lawyer, and uh, the two of you got together? Yes. Well, I'm from California, and she's from Connecticut, Massachusetts. That sounds like a close way to get together. <laughs> and God brought us together in this country. So he go takes you halfway around the world and puts you together? Yes. yes. Isn't God amazing? Yeah, God's amazing in the way He works. Well, so you're there, you're thinking about all these things. God is impressing you that something needs to be done. What exactly did God begin to help you do? Yes, so um, we, were, we felt impressed to do three things, to creatively share the gospel through health, a wellness center, education, and farming. You know, that sounds something like the, uh, the little book here that I read recently called Madison God's Beautiful Farm. I actually read that a year before I came. Oh, you read the book? Oh, my. And God impressed you through that. We need a health work, a agricultural work, and some education work going on. Okay, so uh, Gina, tell us, uh, this wasn't, a, you, you got several things going on here. How did that work itself out? Um, God is so good because when I went back to the States, said we're going to work really hard and come up with the money and it's going to take us a while. But God knew better and said, no, 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 I'm going to provide for you because if you pay for this land, if you pay for these things, you're going to take all the credit. And this huh. is my ministry. Okay. Um, and so we got a call from uh, a person who used to live in that particular area that said, I heard you're looking for land. We should talk. And so we met with her, and she said, here. Uh, we were like, okay, so how much do you want? And she said, I want you to use it for God, and I want you to use it to plant mango trees. And we're like, we can do that. <laughs> so a donation of property. Mm -hmm. How big is that property? It's almost 20 acres. Almost 20 acres. Um, but uh, what I want you to know is that we asked her, when did you buy this land? Uh -huh. And she said, in March of 2014. And that's significant for us because in March of 2014, that's when God gave us the vision, the calling to start this type of ministry. Oh, it's amazing how God is setting things up, planning things ahead of time, providing resources, inspiring people. So God's at work here. He's doing things. What other components did you add to the farm? So every Sunday, there's an English program that happens now. And the beautiful thing about it is that it's actually conducted by the local people. Um, and they're, of course, non-Adventists. But they get to share um, about God through the stories that they, that they teach in English. Mm -hmm. So about a month ago, one of the part of the curriculum was the story of the Good Samaritan. Mm. Um, and what she didn't mention is that our project manager, the one that's running this, up to um, about a couple of months ago, he was baptized. Amen. Um, and it's just so exciting because, you know, he was a young Buddhist man. He was looking for God. And by seeing the testimony, why are you doing this? Why are you giving so much to these people? Because that's what God wants us to do. Amen. Um, and it was through that that led to Bible studies. And now he's one of our Bible leaders, uh, reading, uh, leading Bible studies every Friday in our Unjai house, like we like to call it. 
Amen. So God is setting up things there, but he didn't stop there. He gave you some collaboration with the, actually with the government. Tell us about that. I mean, a communist government, non-Christian society, and God kind of sets something up. Uh, so this is like, like our third miracle, I guess. God is so good. We said, oh, we need information on how to collaborate with the government, um, and, but let's just go and pick up some forms. And our friends were like, you can't go like that. We were going on a mission trip, so we're not dressed appropriately to meet with government officials. So we're like, we have nothing to wear. So we had to go borrow clothes, borrow shoes. We get there, and we knock, and we're like, hi, how do we partner with the governor? Um, and then, <laughs> and they well, looked that's at a good us start like, for things. Uh, you should go upstairs. And we go upstairs, and as we're going upstairs, everyone's looking at us like we're crazy. Um, and then the director, the Minister of Ministry of Health of the whole country comes out and it's like, what are you girls doing? We're like, we're looking to speak to someone in charge about uh, collaborating on a health project. He's like, hmm, come to my office. So he brings uh, the Deputy Ministry of Health and they're sitting in the office and both of us are there and we just tell them how much we love the country and how much we want to help and this is our project. And the Deputy Director, with almost tears in his eyes, he said, that is my dream too. Amen. So uh, you connected with the government officials and now maybe in process of getting some amazing work started there in this country. God is going to bless that I know. But I have a question as we close out. And I want both of you to answer this question so you just have a little time. But how has it impacted your personal life to engage in this kind of work? That is so good. I always wanted to be a missionary, but I couldn't because I wasn't a teacher or in the medical field. And God said, you don't need any of those skills. You just need to serve me and Amen. use your skills to do that. And um, I left the private sector to go on the public sector. So I would have, I still work full time. And then during my second job is this. So I work full time for this and full time for that. And God has been so good. Mm -hmm. yes. So I grew up, I was born and raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, um, but really sometimes we go to places where things do not make sense, so God can reveal to us His love. And the love that God has revealed to me, that is really what I'm willing to share. That's why we are called Unjai. Unjai means warm heart. Do you have a booth here? Yes. Yeah, our booth is number 420. And for more information, you can go to our website. It's unjai.org. Thank you, ladies, so much for sharing with us today. God bless you and the work you're doing. And uh, we'll keep you in our prayers. Thank you. All right. I had the opportunity to go to Uganda and I had been asked by a farmer's cooperative to go into villages and teach farmers how to process the soybeans that they were already growing in a way that would be more healthful for them and also that they could start small businesses. And what I learned when I was there is that they were growing soybeans but they weren't giving any of them to their own children. And their children were actually dying and being malnourished because of lack of protein. And so I knew we had a simple solution right there in the community. And so we started teaching them about soaking the beans, about boiling them, making soy milk, adding the byproduct of the soy milk right back into the porridge that everyone ate for breakfast, and about what a difference that would make in their health. One of the reasons we focus on rural farm families is because that is where the hungry are. The World Food Program estimates there's 795 million hungry people in the world, and 75% of them are in these rural villages. And so with these skills, we believe that they can have an abundant life right in the rural area. One thing that I love about what our Farm Studio team is able to do, especially in the area of Eastern Uganda, is to introduce the gospel to an area that is 80% Muslim. These individuals are going out and taking the message deep, deep into the villages. I mean, they are really willing to sacrifice on our behalf and on behalf of the villagers so that they can bring the message out to people who would never even get to the big city. When I was there in November, one of the places where we trained was in a hospital in a malnutrition ward. And the team didn't even realize it, but they planned it for Thanksgiving Day. So it was kind of surreal to be sitting there and realizing that 
here I was with these incredibly malnourished children and all my friends and family were back here feasting. But you know, it's too late to wait until they get to the malnutrition ward. Two of the children that I interacted with died in the next few days. And we believe that if we can make the effort and the expense to help our team members go out deep into the villages, those families won't have to come into the malnutrition ward. We can prevent that from happening. This team in Uganda has already trained 13,000 villagers. We keep really good records and we're going back now and visiting those same villages and getting to see the impact that we've had. So uh, Joy Kaufman is here with me today. She is the director of Farm Stew. But Joy, tell us, how did God prepare you I mean, I see you in Uganda, you're teaching them how to make soy uh, products. How in the world did God prepare you for that? Well, I was born in an Adventist hospital, became a vegetarian when I was nine, and just became fascinated in nutrition because everyone thought I was going to shrivel up and die <laughs> of malnutrition. They thought I would be stunted, in fact. and. So I ended up studying nutrition in college and studying all about Adventists. Through the clinical research that was available in the 70s and the 80s, I was studying in the early 90s, and you were healthy, but I'd never met an Adventist until I was 35 years old. You're born in an Adventist hospital, but you never met an Adventist until you were 35 years old. This is amazing. <laughs> I uh, think they were praying, though, in that hospital. <laughs> they must have been praying in that hospital and yeah. maybe even dedicated you to service or something. I hope so. <laughs> God reached out to you. What was your background before becoming an Adventist? Well, I married into a Mennonite farm family, actually. I had served overseas internationally with the Mennonite Central Committee, and that prepared me with a heart for international development, which I've had for now three decades. And I just really um, have this deep desire to have a message for our global church that has a global reach, and that's how Farm Stew was really born. How long have you been an Adventist? A little less than two years. <laughs> Now, some of us have been just a little longer. We, we, some of us here have been just a little longer, but it looks like God has just really taken you on the fast pace here. Praise God. You've joined the Adventist Church. You already have ministry going. You're in Uganda. You're working. You're training people. I heard the video, 13,000 people trained. Yeah, we're actually up to 17,000 now. I was there a few weeks ago, and it was just such a powerful thing. These, these team members, and these are church members, lay church members like all of us here at ASI, who are just thrilled to have the opportunity to be trained and equipped with simple health messages that can really help them. So we came up with this acronym, Farm Stew. And yes, these are some of the church members uh, I want to introduce you to. Fiona, especially in the front, a new Adventist like me who is now out training. And she was, she was really not having the ability to share the love of Jesus before, but now she can do that in a daily basis. Amen. So just give us the acronym quickly. What does farm stew mean anyway? I've heard of New Start, but what about this farm stew stuff? Well, Sounds like we should eat it. <laughs> Exactly, and that's what I want you to think of. Something homegrown, something fresh, something local. So Farm Stew is a message, for, a recipe of abundant life. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But for the woman that has to go walk for half a mile to go get water, does she really need to be told to go get fresh air, sunshine, and exercise? <laughs> Probably not. I think not. So we had a few letters to play with there. So we started with farming because you have to be able to grow the food in order to eat it. In some African countries, it would cost 52% of the income just to get five a day of fruits and vegetables. Mm. So we start with farming, attitude, rest, and meals. Oh. Sanitation, temperance, enterprise, and water is our acronym. That is so practical, isn't it? Hey man, thank you. Uh, Joy, that's a blessing that, that you, God has impressed you to come up with this. What impact has this had in the local community? Well, we've had a very powerful impact, but I want to talk spiritually because that's one of the things that excites Amen. us most. The first Sabbath I was there five weeks ago, there was 29 baptisms. Amen. And one of the things I love is that we are able to connect our spiritual health and our physical health. For example, a seed. You all have seen seeds. Did you know that a seed is a perfect image of the Godhead? Mm -hmm. We have a picture of it here. Every seed that can bring forth life in the soil is a three-in-one picture of our one true God. Mm -hmm. And Romans 1.20 tells us that 
everything in creation, the invisible attributes of God are seen in creation. And so we talk about the health of our bodies, eating whole grains and whole seeds. And then also for the soil, we talk about improved varieties of plants and teaching vegetable gardening to women. We have people that are not having headaches now because they're mm -hmm. drinking water all over the country. And we've had impressions from high to low, like the, the head commander of the prisons who's invited us in, he actually is contemplating becoming an Adventist because of sharing the health message with him. So, Joy, we just have a few seconds left, but tell us, how has this changed your life personally to get involved in this kind of work? Well, I'm so blessed. It's actually the Ugandan Adventists and their witness that helped me cross the line of faith to baptism. Amen. I knew I had to be part of this family. And I'm so humbled, especially by the East Central Division and what they're doing. And I just believe all of our resources should be mobilized to help equip our church members throughout the world so that they can bring this message to the world. And I thank you for letting me share it today. What is your website? farmstew.org. Do you have a booth here? We don't have a booth yet, but next year, I hope. <laughs> All right. Praise God. God Thank you, Joy. You. Thank God bless you in the work you're doing and multiply. Thank you. All God right. Bless. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> it's a real blessing today, isn't it? I want to read this to you. It comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 326. It says this, Not more surely is there a place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is the special place designated on earth where we are to be workers for God. Thanks, Steve. Have you been impressed today with the stories of those that have made a sacrifice and have had a passion in their hearts for Jesus? Has that impressed your heart today? You know, I just met with the two ladies that from the unentered country that gave their testimony. And as we prayed together, tears flowed down their face, and I interpreted those tears this way. They have a passion for that country. They have a great desire to see men and women in that country come to Christ and be changed by His grace. You know, I'm always impressed with Jesus' statement in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9, when the Scripture says in Matthew 9 and verse 35 and 36, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease. Jesus' ministry was a comprehensive ministry. He cared for people physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually. Then Jesus makes this amazing statement, but he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. How many of you believe the words of Jesus? Do you believe the words of Jesus? The harvest is what, everybody? The harvest is what? plentiful, but the laborers are what? Few. Is God speaking to your heart today to raise up a new generation of laborers for Him? You know, not long ago, 2015, San Antonio, Texas, there was something going on at the general conference session that you may not have been aware of. ASI sponsored 65 pastors from China, from mainland China, to come to the general conference session. ASI raised that money. Every afternoon, we met with them and we studied the Bible, the great prophetic truths of the Adventist church. Many of them had never had the opportunity to have advanced education before. After that time at the general conference session, we invited them to come on an Adventist history tour with us. We traveled to Washington, New Hampshire and studied the Bible Sabbath at the first Adventist Sabbath Keeping Church. We traveled to William Miller's farm and studied the second coming of Christ. We traveled to Hiram Edson's farm and studied the sanctuary message. We traveled to Battle Creek and studied the origin of our health message. As we were traveling, 
I had an opportunity to interface with many of these Chinese brothers and sisters. And one young lady impressed me greatly. She was about five foot two, and I had to look down quite a bit, and she looked up as we talked. And through the Chinese translator, I asked her, what do you do? She said, I'm a lay person, but I'm a church planter. She said, I've been in a city in China that will remain unnamed, that has over a million people, no Seventh-day Adventist when I went there, and uh, I've been there now four years working by myself and I've raised up an Adventist church. I said to her, what's the most difficult experience you had? What was the hardest? She said, Pastor Mark, I went there alone. I didn't know one person in that city. The nights were horrible. I had little money of self-support and I was staying in a one-room apartment and she said, the most horrible thing is when I would go to bed at night and the rats would climb up on my bed and bite my feet. She said, Pastor, it was horrible. I'd get up at the night and the rats would scatter. I said, why did you stay? Why did you stay? Because there were people that needed to know Jesus. That is the spirit of early Adventism. That is the spirit of ASI, the spirit of commitment, commitment to a prophetic message that goes to the ends of the earth. That is the spirit of sacrifice. That is the spirit of a new generation that God is raising up. I love the song, Heirs of the Kingdom. Oh, why do you slumber? Why are you sleeping so near your blessed home? Work thee, arouse thee, and gird on thine armor. Speed, for the moments are hastening on. I want to be part of that grand and glorious group.